pleased and honored to introduce you to Lars Muller, a graphic designer, as we said, independent publisher, and I stress independent, a passionate educator and advocate of social responsibility. Being a publisher is a complex job. It needs a systemic approach and many skills. With an awakened curiosity, Lars has proven to master all those skills necessary to thrive. To thrive is publishing house into the post-digital economy. In the contemporary interconnected and over-digitalized blue globe, where consumers spend roughly between 6 to 14 hours a day in front of screens, Lars is fearless defending the book and its autonomy. Celebrating the analog, this medium is having instead a kind of renaissance. Like buildings, books needs to inquire on the topic of construction. And Lars is continuously investigating and reinventing this physicality, challenging the size, the tactility, and how the text and images are intrinsically structured. Born in 1955 in Norway, Lars Muller moved to Switzerland in 1963 and studied graphic design in Zurich. Lars established his own studio in Baden in 1982. Today, the house is based in Zurich with a small team of 10 people and a catalog of about 600 titles to date. Few of the great personalities who are part of this amazing program are graphic designer Kenya Hara, industrial designers such as Jasper Morrison and Naoto Fukuzawa, and some among the most influential architects like the stoic Peter Zumthorn or the fluid Zaha Hadid. Lars Muller is a passionate educator and is taught at various universities, is recently taught as regent professor at UCLA, and since 2009 has been visiting lecturer at our universe uh, graduate school of design. I think that Lars proved that the analog and printed book does not need to be defended anymore. And even the future tool of designing and production will be probably more intelligent and more autom automatized than the Aldous page maker he used to work with back in the 90s. The human will always be the choreographer of this delicate dance between the content and the paper in the process of publishing a book. With no further ado, I would like to pass the word to Lars. Please join and welcoming Lars Muller. They first wanted me to sit here, but I realized I move up here. A different light dynamic, I think. Okay. I have to prepare. I got the cold, no water. So, um, welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I was, I just heard, I was a bit irritated that already two years ago somebody tried to get me here. And I wonder why I didn't come, though. So, it's great to be here, um, and it's an amazing place. I, I, uh, uh, I had this very old image of Head as an improvised new uh, university, um, uh, or kind of squeezed in into some into some buildings. And now this is a. It's much nicer than the Tony area in Zurich. No. Um, anyway. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear afterwards whether you had any expectations or whether I can meet any expectations. The thing is that I, or actually I, I just start my lecture um, and then we find out. In my lecture, I fade out the current reality of a world in turmoil 
and I idealize aspects that seem indispensable to me even under adverse circumstances. If we as designers want to make an effective contribution to our society. My presentation is addressed in particular to students and young professionals, assuming you are bright, talented and hungry. Recently, in conversation with a group of designers, young designers, I claimed that it makes little sense to concentrate only on showing and explaining examples of one's work in lectures when every design practice already has its own portfolio website and people will know about your achieve achievements long before you arrive on stage. But the internet rarely tells us anything about people's convictions, their aspirations and struggles. Would it make sense to present fewer works in lectures but more thoughts instead? or at least to embed the work in a wider context. I do my best to follow this percept. Analog reality. We can't deny the fact that our life remains analog despite the massive changes that information technology and the related devices have brought to our everyday routines. Life as a material system has consequences for my carbon footprint, for example, which is in any case alarming. Recently, I accepted an invitation to attend a conference in Mexico City. Flying across the Atlantic and back alone adds half a planet to my negative record. Last year, my consumption was 4.5 planets, and this year won't be any better. I'm worried. As a walking advertisement for an industry that depends so much on the physicality of its product, I struggle to find alternatives to what I have bec become used to love doing, traveling the world together with my books, to Tokyo, Sao Paulo, Shanghai, or New York. I once exercised holding a lecture via Skype. It isn't appealing at all to look into a camera instead of the eyes of your audience. New technologies won't compensate for my insane mobility. My hope that my publishing activities will contribute to the awareness of others is a weak excuse. I admit I can't go, I, it can't go on like this. Indi individual energy consumption cannot be the yardstick of growing success or attention. I need to change my habits. Reflecting on the world that surrounds us both the obviously visible physical design and the invisible designer babies or Hubble signals from outer space, we may be excited or frightened, or both. The destiny of man is progress and growth. Whether we like it or not, as designers from all disciplines, we are accomplices in the big game. As a consequence and without arrogance, I can say that I am convinced that we as designers must be ahead of our audience. Only our lead in awareness, knowledge and experience makes it legitimate to us to offer solutions and suggestions to other people. In order to find my own position in this game, to think independently, and to act freely, I define three fundamental conditions for my life. Authenticity means to know who I am and where I come from, 
to recall my earliest memories and to realize that I grew up in a continuum of events in real time. It is a fundamentally, it is fundamentally analog experience in a social and cultural environment that made me become me. On this basis, we develop our personalities and recognize our strengths and acknowledge our weaknesses. My uniqueness is the source of a self-determined life. Authenticity. New media and technology suggest the illusion that there is an identity outside of oneself. But there is no way to escape your authentic body. Face it and live an authentic life in real time, breath by breath, without interruption. Authenticity is the aggregate of yourself. The integrity of a person is articulated in his or her beliefs, behavior and actions, how we live and what we do. Parts of our personalities are given, while other parts are shaped over time. Both parts are precious. They are symbiotic and indivisible. As designers, artists, architects, we must have high awareness for authenticity. It determines our ability to think for others and to anticipate the consequences of what we do. If we recognize the world as an analog totality, defined by, by physicality, by volume and weight, and not least by our fragile bodies, we become aware of the systems which rule the world. I see this awareness and the understanding of systems not only as a precondition for an authentic life, but also as a significant driver of change. We interact daily with, with and within systems, starting from our own body, our digestive system, our nervous system, the cardiovascular system. Then there are communication systems, traffic control systems, trade, finances, democracy, and so forth. On the other end of the scale, we observe the solar system and search for the master system beyond. From the simple to the most complex, all systems depend on the precise interaction of their components. Systems are vulnerable. As a boy, I opened the, my alarm clock to observe its function, functioning and get behind the TikTok. What caught my interest was the little balance wheel, which moved by, was moved by a little torsion spring, which of course, and I, I tried to show this, this is, this is the, in German it's the Unruh, the balance, the torsion spring, which does this very, very delicate move. Um, but, of course, once loosened, you never bring it back to function again. So, I made my observation, but the clock was gone. The mechanical world was fully satisfied. Uh, in the mechanical world, or the mechanical world fully satisfied the joy of discovery and for very long, our tools of communication expressed their functionality with, with typical sounds. And I again, I recall your memory. Um, whenever you, you heard somebody in a, even a, in the upper floor, like the neighbor was not, not uh, playing violin, but writing on a typewriter, right? It was a very mechanical, very... Uh, typical, and one day you observe the typewriter and you understand what actually makes that noise. So you really get behind the, the system. The same with the telephone, maybe. 
and uh, this is my favorite instrument, which uh, I, I don't know if it, it, it sounds ridiculous, but it was this do, do you remember that SX70 sound? You know, the Polaroid, absolutely magic sound, and then you were kind of warming, uh, you know, the, the image. And, um, anyway, so we, we kind of felt we understood the systems, but not anymore. The blank face of our most used device doesn't reveal any of its many functions. But of course, information technology and all electronic devices depend on sophisticated mathematical systems. How does this express in our disciplines? Systemic thinking is inherent in every design process. In fact, it is a very human approach to analyzing and understanding the nature of a problem. The success depends on the completeness of the observation. In general, lacking a fundamental grasp for systems will lead to, po to poor concepts. Visualizing a system may help to reveal the weak spots. Sorry. That may be very loud now. Sorry. <laughs> Good. OK. Um, citizenship is the third of my conditions for understanding and accepting the responsibility I bear as a designer. Being a citizen means participating in the enduring process of building, shaping, and sustaining society with a fundamental understanding of all communities as the social and cultural drivers of society. Rural, suburban, and urban communities all over the world are the places where we shape society through interaction and where the principles of equality, diversity, inclusivity and solidarity are lived and exercised. Here we can experience new models of living together and define the rules we want the government and lawmakers to abide by in governing our country. Think global, act local, as Buckminster Fuller urged us to do in 1929, will allow us to behave as citizens in our closest communities, our nations, and as inhabitants of the global village. This is analog reality, and authenticity, system awareness, and citizenship are the premises for change. It is the destiny of humankind, due to its intelligence, to strive for change and progress. More than ever, we must do so with the utmost of mi mindfulness and care, so as not to endanger the great achievements of civilization. As designers of all kinds, we are more aware than many others. We are in the vanguard of the movement. We are the transformers of new achievements in science and technology. We validate content, we communicate with the help of analogies and metaphors, with unseen images, and on top of the function, with the beauty of our design. What a challenge, you may say, and you're right. Being a designer means much more than giving form to pre to prefabricated content. Create content, edit content, define the narrative, shape the context, prepare for change, become authors and editors in all design disciplines, from fashion to product in art, architecture, media, and communication. 
put the information and animation in the place of manipulation and consumption. Arm yourself with knowledge, wit, and humor. Take advantage of the marvelous community you are part of and bridge over to other disciplines. Collaborate, activate, influence, change. It is by far not only climate change that demands our comprehension and action. Democracy is equally endangered, as is the concept of human rights. Artificial intelligence, declining biodiversity, aging society, population growth, hunger, poverty, distribution of values and resources, clash of religions, migration, are just some of the key words. We are challenged as designers, but even more so as inhabitants of this planet. Take action and don't leave it to politics. In 20 years from now, your generation will rule the world. When it comes to my own activity as a designer and publisher, I must confess that it is a challenging task to live up to all of one's ideals and ethical principles in daily practice. You will develop stubbornness to help you withstand the many compromises along the way to your self-fulfillment. As a young age, at a young age and looking back, I was lucky to be idealistic and naive enough to accept two strong personalities as my role models. Swiss graphic design pioneer Josef Müller Brockmann taught me the ethical rules of design. He was a determined modernist and convinced of the power of design and visual communication. Richard Paul Lose, a Swiss artist in the constructivist style and a staunch socialist, was my ideologic master. His art is a manifestation of individuality and equivalence. Um, I just felt uncomfortable this morning by not adding, and then I did, a third person, which is uh, Max Bill, who I distinguish from the other two because we never befriended. Um, we were both skeptical somehow on the distance, but still I think I learned a lot from him um, because he was the one living uh, the, the most coherent biography. As a, as a very young man, 70 year old, he, be, he, be, he was a student at the Bauhaus and then he continuously built up a career as a generalist, we may say, who was active and also very talented, very brave in, in many uh, artistic uh, uh, disciplines. He, was, he considered himself an artist and an architect, sculptor, graphic designer, writer. He was a politician. He was... Uh, he, was, he joined the parliament, first the, the communal parliament in Zurich and then the national parliament in, in Bern, uh, before he gave up and said, well, there is no, there is no space for creation in politics. So, um, we should have taught the politicians to change, no? They, but they just let him go. Um, anyway, so I, I, I kind of... I uh, offer myself the excuse to include you, Max, uh, in my lecture. Um, if, you, if you just become aware of this poster, which he designed in 1931, right? For young, young uh, designer students, I would say it could be any year later in the 20th century, but it was designed in 1931. And, um, uh, now let me count back. Uh, Max Bill was born in 19... 
Does anybody know? 10, 11? So he was at the age of 20, 21, right? So, you know, you have nothing to lose. Just go on and do and show the world what you think and what you, what you have in mind and stand the critique, right? Max Bill was not loved for this poster back in 31. Um, anyway, so I, I, uh, I think I did my duty to Max. Getting back um, to Richard Paul Lose, who, who um, I think we cannot underestimate the, the, the conceptual, the systematic uh, value of, of his art, and uh, which is really based on, it's, it's a social or a model for society which would uh, promise uh, individual freedom with equal rights. So in a painting like this one, every color is represented by the same amount, same quantity, and the system would allow you to create countless variations of the, of the image which would just fulfill our, or, or uh, express that rule of uh, equality. Now, political conviction can hardly be expressed in design, and yet when is, what is factual and functional about Swiss design is very accommodating to my societal convictions. In addition, this attitude towards design, rationality, objectivity, functionality, gives my limited talent both an anchor and a direction. Another master, the Dutch designer Wim Crowell, must take responsibility for me becoming a publisher. His notion that, all, that of all printed matter, only the book is meant to last made me adjust my focus. For many years, my design studio supported my publishing enterprise financially and allowed me to remain independent and to follow my principles without compromise. To compensate for the fact that there are many more fine professionals in design and architecture than there are good clients, I prefer to choose my clients myself rather than waiting for commissions. You may ask me afterwards, well, how did you do that? Uh -huh. I tried to convince them with my better concept and good design. Um, not all believed, so. Um, I get there. Um, compared to today, to today, the 80s and 90s were a golden age for graphic designers. Many Swiss companies and institutions were looking for new and contemporary visual expressions, not least in view of the changes emerging from the digital technology. Uh, that was in 1994, the first website for Vitra. Uh, and, and some of you may, may remember that pioneer uh, age uh, lots of promises and super slow and um, a lot of hope and promise anyway. Um, but we were able to play and, and manipulate with colors, so every time you opened the page there was a different set of colors, which I think is very common today. Um, and also, and, and your chance being in Geneva, uh, I think the United Nations is one of the biggest clients in the world, right? And they publish something like 1,400 books a year. Huh? Terrible design. And very, very badly paid. But that's, you know, it's okay. You know, if you, if you, if you, you deal Freedom, uh, you know, the, the less money, the more freedom. 
That should be the deal. At least that was what I did. Um, anyway, just to say that went on for quite a while and uh, allowed me to become uh, a publisher uh, in parallel to find my orientation. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, that's another one. This is important. I cultivated, I cultivate, still do, I cultivate a culture of saying no. Of course, a harsh no is rude. But if you add a brief explanation, you are released with respect and your yes becomes more valuable. Following an early resolution, I kept my business small enough to keep control over all decisions and processes. I named the company after myself and don't hide behind a fantasy name. I take the blame and pride alike for what I'm doing. At Lars Müller Publishers, we maintain a flat hierarchy and, and allow for leadership through competence. In an industry where income is limited, other benefits must provide the incentive. Of the 20 to 25 titles we produce per year, at least half must be initiated by me or developed with my participation and will be designed in-house, while the other half may be the result of my positive response to proposals that correspond to my personal interests and contribute to the overall program. I don't consider publishing a service to the author, but rather a partnership with the goal of offering the best to the reader in the meaningful context of my program. Our editors and copy editors must commit themselves to the motto, the editor is the advocate of the reader. In this sense, I reject the trend towards self-publishing, which often spares the cost of editing. As a comparison, um, the, profession, the professional process of book production is very complex. It may start rather simple um, in a, with a conversation between the author and the publisher, um, but soon after, you may have to deal with an involved institution, maybe uh, a museum, uh, a university, uh, however. Uh, very often, you depend on a sponsor. Um, and then, of course, you, you may find or decide for an editor, which is a go-between between, between the author and the publisher and is actually the person in charge, the person with the most authority um, and the, the, the broadest understanding of the needs and the, 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 the ambitions of the project. Um, you may have uh, other authors involved, you may have photographers contributing image, and you may, and I put them, him or her in the center, the designer, because the designer again, is, relate, is linked to the author and to the publisher and to the editor. So it's in a key, key position um, before starting transforming content into form. Once it goes towards uh, production, then you have a printer, lithographer, copy editors taking care of uh, text quality, translators, and um, all together, then together with marketing, media, consumer, uh, makes the full picture. Um, but I'm happy to just focus on that very role uh, of, the, of the publisher, um, respecting very much and, uh, and appreciating very much the, the, the huge and patient work of all my collaborators. Okay. Ah. 
my first book, which I published in 1983, was dedicated to the modernist movement in Switzerland after World War II. Die gute Form, good design, documents Swiss product design from the 1950s and 60s. The research allowed me to understand the differences between the modernist environment of my parents in comparison to what was common sense at the time. The book was produced exclusively with analog means. Uh, a bit behind. Um, an, an Apple Macintosh made it onto my desk in 1985 and was only a promise. The system crashed quite frequently, which was manifested through the bomb, an unthinkable symbol today. It was not until the early 90s that we were able to deliver electronic files for printing. Over the years, I dedicated many books to the history of, Swiss modernist, of the Swiss modernist movement. I was partly, partly influenced by my mentors, but also driven by my own search for understanding and by the timeless value I see in some of the movement's achievements. This is um, a book I, I authored, I wrote, on, on my mentor, Müller Brockmann, partly also to free myself. I think it's a, maybe a good idea, you know, if you, if you have a very strong road model which you, you depend on for very long, if you really have to find a way to distance yourself, then you may want to write a book about her or him. Um, at least I did, and it was very painful. Um, anyway, so my, uh, my um, road models, let me see what's next. Yeah. Mm. The, for example, the typeface Helvetica, an all-time favorite, also of many architects and designers, and still considered the best legible typeface on the screen. It is also a reliable companion in the hands of dilettants. I did a more serious observation on uh, Helvetica, um, and uh, to be fair, also, there were fractions at the same time, which is in, we talk about the, the 60s and maybe 70s, and uh, let's say the Zurich School was the more the Helvetica uh, fraction, while the Basel School um, with Emil Ruder were much more fond of Univer, which was much more technoid, and much more sh kind of sharper uh, and, and uh, um, cooler typeface, to say. Um, so in my program, you, you may, may find them both. They were, they were not enemies, but, but strong opponents back then, um, which today we think is ridiculous. Over a distance of 65 kilometers, uh, they had bitter fights, and very often also expressed in a, a magazine, which was the Typographische Monatsblätter, which was under Emil Ruder's control. Um, uh, and, and I compare the, the conflict or the, the, the kind of the rhetoric uh, war they were fighting with my experience when I was young and Leninists and Marxists were kind of discussing and fighting the Trotskyists, right? While now from a historic distance you may say, come on, you know, it's all the same, right? It doesn't matter at all. Um, anyway, but I'm very proud to, to kind of to bring them together uh, in, in my program and somehow be, be understand or understanding enough in, in both directions 
so I can act as an editor and not being, you know, a party, uh, also educated by the Zurich guys. Uh, at last, I presented the reprint of this famous but rare magazine, Neue Grafik, New Graphic Design, Graphisme Aktuell. It was published in Zurich from 1958 till 1965 and had an enormous influence on the recognition of the, the so-called Swiss style all around the world. Actually, this is Neue Grafik. Uh, Actually, we are working on the reprint of the famous design manual by Müller Brockmann from 1983 for the Swiss Railways. Now and then, I, uh, I have published reprints of rare publications from the avant-garde movement of the 20th century, which deserve to survive in physical form. These days, I am presenting a collection of reprints on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus. It is often said, and certainly true, the future needs the past. The paradigm shift brought about by the digital transformation has detached many people from history. If you really are honest to yourself and you say, okay, how much do I care, how much do I know about uh, the time, let's say, before, um, however, or the, the time of your, the used time of your parents or your grandparents or the time before World War II? What do we know about the time of the so-called Cold War? This is all the time before 1985, before we really were introduced to the digital and the so-called paradigm shift, which where people suggested to us that things, life would change, like the paperless office, right? Uh, the digital book and so forth. And obviously the propaganda was strong enough to detach us from the past. Right, to say, oh, this is day one of the future. Hmm? And I think that uh, we do good as designers, especially to just realize and recognize that that is not true. You know, that the continuation of history of time has not been interrupted or disrupted by the technological revolution, if you want. And I, I, I say this because I think it, it helps me understand politics. It helps me understand also uh, struggles, um, you know, we may have in social, social uh, uh, questions that it, it's hard. It was so hard to get us where we are, right? And, and uh, I don't know, um, I, 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 was, I was engaged yesterday in the protest march in Zurich um, where f for the 1st of May and there was a very, very strong manifestation of, of women, women of your age, just saying it's about time to stop it now, right? Give us equal rights and it was promised for so long, but it remained a promise, and now it's about the time to make it true. We don't need a Greta from Sweden to tell us or to tell politicians, it's good that she comes, but poor girl, she should go to school, right? Politicians should do it without that voice, you know? By now we should know that, you know, evolution over 200 years of industrialization has destroyed the environment, period, right? And we cannot accept that, that there is an age before the, comp before the digital and an age after the digital, no. And I think that is very important for us to discuss and become aware and maybe, maybe also see the consequences and eventually see strategies 
by whoever. Uh, I don't know. I don't believe in dark powers anywhere, <laughs> but there are interests which we may not necessarily consider in our everyday uh, discussions. Anyway, if we agree, um, it is often said and certainly true, the future needs the past. The paradigm shift brought about by the digital transformation has detached many people from history. A critical assessment of the opportunities and risks of the foreseeable future calls for engaging with the history of modernity so we can better understand it and to discuss the legacy of the modern is it changeable or obsolete, and to overcome its achievements if necessary. That is the task of us all. Mm. Ah. Well, um, 20 years ago, the independent publishing industry began to decline. Many bookstores gave up under the pressure of Amazon, and small publishers often sold their business to big corporations. Publishers and designers were equally overwhelmed by the changes in trade and technology. The misleading reaction was often gross, here, while downscaling was not an alternative. In marketing, we searched for new forms of, rep of presentation and for two years traveled the world with our nomadic bookstore, a pop-up store which drew exclusive attention to the books and led to unique adventures and lasting friendships. Our the, the finale was uh, uh, two years ago at the Salone in Milano, where on the piazza um, we had a 24-hour pavilion designed by students of the Architectural Association in London. Um, was great success. I think 10,000 people walked through, at least walked through uh, our pavilion. Um, and we had book launches and signings. Um, anyway, it was a manifesto just to say, OK, we we do not give up and we do not, uh, you know, let's say, hand over power exclusively to uh, Amazon. So it's a little bit a, a David and Goliath uh, game, right, where the, the, the little one really fights the, the monster. I remained stoic uh, and focused more on architectural books, which had the most reliable market. I took pleasure in publishing early books by architects and in observing ways to represent architecture through photography while paying special attention to the character and atmosphere of buildings. I consider the photographer a co-author of the book and involve him or her closely in the process. Some of these books have set standards in their category, like this first book on the work of Swiss architect Peter Zumthor. When Zumthor accomplished his thermal bath in Wals in 1997 at the edge of international fame, the most respected architectural critics offered their writing and caused a dilemma for the architect. I convinced him to write the book himself and to make it a piece by and not about him. All of Zumthor's buildings were re-photographed in one summer by Swiss-British photographer Helen Binet. Her analog black and white, no wide angle, daylight only photography, photography matched our ambitions perfectly. Together with the author's text and straightforward typography and graphics, the contributed, they contributed to a radical dark yet warm object which resonates the architect's characteristics. My collaboration with Helen Binet continued and included several books um, on Zaha Hadid's architecture, 
or on Peter Eisenmann's. This is Hmm. Okay. In dealing with the many images that often come together in the book, the wall has proven to be my most reliable working tool. I lure busy authors into my studio and compose their book with them. The design of the book will casually adapt to the content, while the cover design remains my privilege. Contrary to the, mark, to the rules of marketing, I usually forego the visual representation of the content and prefer typographic covers and clear colors, if not black or white. I also search for ways to manipulate the surface of the thin cover cardboard to create a three-dimensional impression and a tactile sensation on what I call the facade of the book. This is the cliche for this embossing, which is uh, 0.3 millimeter deep. So it's a complete illusion. Hmm. Okay, it's, it's not necessarily forced to be black and white or, or typographic. It, it's just that um, if, you, if you offer yourself some restrictions, then you open up a field of inventions. I don't know, Karuj uh, is not so far away. I don't know if anybody uh, is familiar with the name Krista de Karuj. She passed away last year. Um, and, uh, you know, how, how, how else than this way should I do a cover? It's a very soft Japanese silk on a, on a, on a soft uh, uh, surface with a black embossing. And we both loved the book very much. I love white books. They are so innocent when they are new and they take on your traces, your personal. They become yours immediately. Now, however, there are exceptions where the content requests visual representation on the cover. And it would be, oh, not yet. Um, you may know this one. It was, uh, so uh, Head was involved at least in the financing, I believe. Um, anyway, there are exceptions where the content requests visual representation. And it would just be a, 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 a silly refusal not to do it, right? There are some small publishing houses which may depend very much on a strong corporate design and say, oh no, our covers must be uh, in that dark gray and uh, small type. And they may succeed, but they, they may have some limitations. It's a, it's a brave uh, publishing house, Quart Verlag in, uh, in Lucerne. They are also trying to open up a bit, but they have a series of super similar books on architects uh, with no expression of the content. Um, I, I just, I'm a generation of publishers in the meantime, which really compete if there is competition with international uh, publishing houses. So I think that the, the market would just not 
recognize or appreciate if he would go for a kind of a Swiss, uh, uh, you know, design attitude, which you would you would acclaim, but um, the market wouldn't recognize. So. Um, I, I would I would accept any kind of critique from the side of young designers if you say you comp I compromise with the design of my covers. It may be certainly true, but it also that true that the the value, the importance a cover or the book design overall takes in my in my history, in my biography has changed. I started as a designer. And by now I'm a publisher. And I just realized that it's just a different role in the same game. Anyway, those are some examples of covers which I actually like. Uh, I especially like this one. Um, uh, this gentleman was a, is a part of the, the so-called Higgs team. So he won the Nobel Prize together with um, other uh, scientists for discovering the, the divine piece, you know, the, the, the Higgs. Are you familiar with that? You're a couple of years ago? Anyway, but he's desperate in front of his coffee machine, right? So, what the hell? And as you see in his shorts and, uh, you know, those, th those people are dangerously intelligent, right? But somehow they capitulate in front of their coffee machine. We talked about the generalist and the specialist before, no? no? Maybe here we have a, a prototype specialist. Um, also important to visualize this, the, the, the transformation of Mecca, um, which um, you must see because the book is full of images. Then, together with Jasper, we felt like, well, the cover is a little bit empty, so what could it be? And then uh, there was this little drawing of a very casual wine glass he, he, he designed for a, in an Italian manufacturer. I think it, we would call it a, a ballon, no? It's a kind of a round, comfortable, uh, glass, red wine glass. Um, I thought, well, um, why not? You know, it's an invitation um, to put this drawing uh, on the cover. Um, the Hard Life also um, deserves uh, some examples. Shitsuko Yoshikawa, um, I may introduce her to you. She passed away a month ago. Uh, she was the wife of uh, Josef Müller Brockmann, um, born in Japan, and uh, uh, maybe as an encouragement for all young female designers and talents at the age of uh, 27 in 1960, she, 61, she decided to go to Europe and study design and architecture in Ulm. Right? And she left Japan, which was not very usual for young women then. And um, she spoke fluently English, and she considered arriving in Germany, everybody will speak English. Now you arrive in Germany and nobody speaks English in 1961. So she had to learn German first. And she studied, and then she came to Switzerland working with uh, Müller Brockmann. And later, in 1967, got married. And uh, in 1972, uh, thanks to his uh, support, she started painting in the style of the Zurich Concrete School. Uh, so it's not abstract, it's concrete, it's, it's an inventive art. And I was uh, very close to her as I was to him since 1978. And three years ago, we, she and I and some friends set up a foundation which is now taking care of 
of her work and his work and uh, part of the activities of the foundation is the, the Shizuku Yoshikawa Award for Young Artists, Female Artists, and uh, Josef Müller Brockmann Award for uh, Young Male and Female Designers. Has that made the round uh, with you? I think the application uh, deadline is somewhere around now for the Müller Brockman Award. Has that been discussed at head? No? Then we must urgently talk about that. You tell me. Anyway, now I don't know it, uh, how appropriate that is, but if, Lor, you can raise yourself for a second. Lor Marville is, was the winner last year of the Shizuko Yoshikawa Award for Young Female Artists. Congratulations again. All right. I try to get to an end here, um, and then, uh, then we, we may uh, enter the more, much more interesting uh, conversation. Uh, some more covers um, with image, decoration, photographs. Of course, you can, can create drama with, with photographs and images. Uh, I want to get back to return for a moment to my praise for analog reality. The creative disciplines have all integrated digital technology into their workflow. Intelligent software controls and optimizes complex planning and development processes. Only the idea, the first sketch, the actual act of design, resists this development. The best designers know that the shortest way from brain to image is through their hand and that no software can replace their personal signature. Just as an encouragement and also in graphic design, communication design, um, there, is, there are some super encouraging examples and it's really fun making. It's kind of whatever, a delicatesse in, in, in analog design, right? If you try to design a, a poster in real size without the computer. So, I really hope to encourage young designers to praise their sketchbooks. It is not its brand that matters, right? So. You don't need a moleskin to, to collect your sketches, necessarily. At some point in my career, um, no, no, that's not true. My interest in architecture drawings was aroused by Louis Kahn's sketches, and I asked befriended architects for their sketchbooks, which we faithfully reproduced. Stephen Hall, Hall's daily exercise with watercolors, Eduardo Suoto de Mura bold in ink strokes and Su Fujimoto's delicate thin lines, or Wang Shu, the Chinese uh, Pritzker Prize winner's impeccable drawn bird views, um, are examples of how the signature of the architect is expressed through his drawings. At some point in my career, I had a desire to take a step out of the niche of beauty, and I added society as a ca category to my publishing program. The type of book I developed in this context, I call visual reader. Um, we ignore this one. Um, I call visual reader. I, it refers to an experience I had while contemplating the universe of Buckminster Fuller, whom I call one of my mentors, although we never met. Working on the book on Bucky in 1998 made me understand that his obsessions and inter inventions were best expressed through images arranged in a way that makes them evoke questions and lead to engaged reading. 
a challenge today, as you know, due to the rapid changes in reading habits. Since then, I count the length of a text in time rather than in words. The reader is invited to browse through the book and read the images and in the same mood absorb short texts which offer basic information and provoke deeper interest which is satisfied by longer reading. I adapted this model to such topics as human rights, democracy, or water. A book on systems is in the making. Content of this complexity requires a careful conceptual process and persistent editing. Working on books of this kind gives me a feeling of relevance and social responsibility. I am not only a designer and publisher, I am also a human and a citizen. Thank you. Okay. Maybe now is the time to make an uh, advertising break. Huh? I like to advertise the uh, Librairie de Lille, uh, right? Who has bravely in the center of their store uh, a display of roughly 30, 40 books from my recent program. Um, da 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 da, that was it. Oh. And right. it, it will be on for a while. They, um, they are hoping for a good summer. Okay. Thank you, Lars. I guess you can probably have a seat and relax for yeah. 30 seconds for my okay. introduction, and then we'll get back to, uh, to you. Um, so it's, um, I mean, it's probably time for uh, comments and questions. So what I suggest is that... Uh, Damien and myself will make some quick comments and, and, and questions and discussion with, uh, with Lars and then probably in 15 minutes or so we can take questions from, from the room and hopefully uh, continue that, 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 kind of, uh, that kind of discussion. Um, so if I have the mic so I can probably start, start off if that's, ahead, if, that, if that's okay for you. I have a mic too. Ah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so, well, first, thank you very much for uh, the nice um, I mean, overview of your perspective and then how it translates on your work and its evolution. I mean, um, uh, one of the points that I find is quite intriguing is probably uh, the kind of topic I wanted to uh, ask you questions about is how this, I mean, how it, what you reflected on in your career can be reflected in choices in terms of design education, because uh, what you what, what you discussed is somehow the kind of not necessarily conclusion, but some kind of perspective you built over time. Uh, you said you started as a designer, and then now you're a publisher, and that's something that that, that evolved. And you 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 I mean you I, I took some notes. You encourage students to be bright, talented, and hungry to uh, I mean to be one step ahead of the audience or uh, the clients, for, for instance. And I'm, I'm curious about, I mean, uh, how, how does this translate into design education? How do you, I mean, if you look at, if you look back at your career, at, at what point did you, did you understand what you were doing, uh, actually? <laughs> Was it something that you uh, started uh, with this kind of perspective that you will do that? Or how did it change over time? and how this can, can be reflected in, in the way we teach design uh, nowadays. Um, okay, may, I may be the oldest designer in the room. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's, it's really a question of generation, right? Design was just a different thing in the 70s when I was 
at school. So, 75 to 79. Um, and my teachers were the, the students of Müller Brockmann and Armin Hoffmann. Um, I, I only knew, well, yeah, students of. That, that my teacher generation was Roche Pfund in Geneva, right? Georges Kalam, those were the ones. Jean Wittme, you know. Hey, come on. That was, that, those were heroes. Those were giants in visual communication. They created kind of mass relevant messages for people. Hmm? It was not decorating the world. It was not kind of offering design service. So those were the, were the people who we admired as students because we felt like, yes, they were ahead. They had a vision. They had an idea. They were discussing amongst it, them, them, the designers. And we were very lucky. And if I say we, it's actually, and, and I know he's, he's, uh, he's a little bit on and off and uh, a love-hated person, uh, Rudi Bauer, was my closest friend. We, we spent 80% of our time together, we worked together, and we learned from these guys, right? And we realized that what brings them ahead of their audience, what, what um, enables them to find and, and to propose solutions for society, was their enormous knowledge and their unlimited interest. They were so curious. And to our surprise, they were curious to know what we think, our opinion. So at the age of 22, we were in, in discussion with the brightest minds in Swiss design. And I, I think that is something I would, I would like to tell you there is no barrier, you know. There, there is no reason to separate generations. You know, they, we depend on each other. And that's why I say it's, it, it, nothing has changed, but the attitude has changed. You know, that the, the sources are the same. What do you mean by change of attitude? Probably you can... Yeah, well, the, that. That, that, that young people just feel comfortable just being young. Huh? It's not going to last. Well, it's not going to last, though. They, 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 no, they don't ask you. you know? No, it's not going to last. You, you're not it's not going to last. Well, that you say. Uh, no, I, I mean, it's, it's, I, I hope for your comment afterwards, but it's just that, you know, fi find out what we share and, and not what separates, right? And, and then you may, I don't know, another question I ask uh, people younger than me, I say, well, who, what's the age of the, of the oldest person you know and you frequently meet, right? Mm. No, they are not interested in meeting with elderly people. But I tell you, that is a source which is soon gone, right? It's super exclusive if you can talk with your grandmother who loves you, right? And say, Grandma, how was it the first time with Grandpa? Where? How? Did he behave? Bath. You know, you can ask intimate questions to a person who, who experienced the world 100 years before you, right? And how, and they, they walked, you know, then you have this story from Grandpa who walked to work an hour and a half one way and back in the evening. Those stories is, are what you hear. And then you, you relate that to your own experience, you know, and to, to the exclusivity of, you know, what, was, there, was there meat once a week, you know? Now we take the pleasure of considering, considering vegan food a luxury today, right? Now, if you just create the context, it's so easy. You just have to communicate. And that makes you, that opens your mind as a designer, that brings you ahead of your audience, that enables you to, 
to find solutions, to, 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 to speak to smart people and to create a message which is valuable and meaningful for, the, uh, for society. I talk from the perspective of a graphic dis communication designer now. There are product designers here, there are fashion designers here, but it's the same for you too. You know? Contextualize and broaden, broaden, broaden the picture. And does, does this kind of uh, curiosity towards like different generation also expands to the, 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 the partners, the, the clients, the authors, the photographers, the designers you worked with? When, when you showed this, this picture with all those different uh, contributors mm -hmm. to, uh, to books, mm -hmm. the books you, you mm -hmm. published, I guess there's also a, a huge quantity of knowledge to learn from the interaction with, with those people. And that's probably not something you, mm -hmm. you anticipated when you... Oh when yes, you started. that was exactly what I, what I anticipated. Oh, okay, so, yeah, so that's, that's exactly it. that. I thought, I, I, want, I want to know what the others do. I want, to, I want to enjoy the process. I spent day and night at the printing machine. I didn't have to, but I want to, and I became friend with the printer. I brought the beer, you know, and then, and then we were watching the sheets coming. No, that, it's the contrary. It's, I, I just, and I don't want to compare it. I want, just want to encourage something that, that seems so natural and normal, which is the analog process. Things happen in time. And if you leave the room, then you miss the event. So please stay and watch it happen. Watch, watch your mama cooking dinner, and then you will understand why it's so damn good, no? Yeah, so, so, somehow, uh, Lars, uh, um, um, you mentioned that you have mentor, and this intergenerational thing is quite uh, important in mm -hmm. what you say, that uh, like uh, Joseph Muller Brockman was close to you, or you were close mm -hmm. to him as a, as a pupil, and, and try to grasp all the secrets of, of the, this métier. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and somehow uh, this uh, kind of guru, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, or we may say renaissance uh, way of having an atelier in which there is the master, and then you have the, the, the pupil who is learning from the master, is somehow gone. I mean, uh, the last I know uh, really now are in Venice, maybe the, 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 the glass blowers are still have this structure in which you have like uh, mm -hmm. uh, the main master, then they have the second master, and and there is these 20 years of learning <laughs> before you can be the master yourself mm -hmm. uh, or Japanese culture. And, and, and we, we started before an internal discussion about how industry is affecting this model somehow. And uh, do you think that uh, and now, I mean, like, uh, is possible nowadays to co take back this model? And, uh, and do you think is young uh, and generation could be a, a eager to have this model? Or you think it's going to be more fast more quick, more um, a, a kind of generation which moves faster into different offices. Mm -hmm. It comes mm -hmm. to you, they do two years, and then they move over. Um, I, I, I re at the danger of the lecture I gave to you, uh, I know, but I promise myself I do not want to sound old tonight. Right? So what I say is, or what I claim is that analog is avant-garde. Huh? And that's a secret we share within this room and we don't tell anybody, you know. Analog is avant-garde. If you really become aware of how the analog was kind of through the propaganda 30 years ago, right, was under pressure, right, Ah, analog is out, it's slow, it's oh, and so it's heavy, and so. Uh, and now it's back. Be why? Because we as human beings do not mutate fast enough. The industry would love us mutating much, much, much faster. Right? But we don't. Maybe our thumbs do. Right? But oh, as a whole, we don't. If this is the case, then I think we do very good in investing in our analog experience. 
right? And that's a secret we share. If we are the ones investing, then we may be pretty sure that we, at a certain moment, will belong to an elite, and now not in a negative connotation, but by knowing more and having more significant experience, right? Because, and, and I so strongly believe and that, that the world will accommodate in this analog and digital field, and we will be so super comfortable enjoying the analog when analog matters and digital when the digital matters. Now, who do you want to learn, learn from? And don't call them master anymore. That is out, right? Mentor is okay. You know, I, I still engage mentors. You know, I, I may engage uh, specialists coming to my studio and mentoring us through process, right? So, a mentor is doing yeah, but, good to but, you. Sorry, Lars, but that is, is to me like, a, a, like this kind of master at like a, a kind of intimate relationships to the students. So there was something more. We, we discussed about AG Fronzoni, who, who, who set up in Milano mm -hmm. in the 60s, uh, a private school in which he invited for over uh, two decades students all over the place to learn from him. And, uh, and if you have to pay, pay someone to give you tips, that is going into this industrialized system uh, that somehow is trapping yeah. you in a kind of, uh, yeah, economical, uh, economical exchange. And, and mm -hmm. this beauty of uh, yeah, understanding the analog as uh, the freest and most open source mm -hmm. way, uh, I would see much more into this kind of relationship in which we engage something that you said before, maybe you don't, you don't uh, uh, get a lot of money, but you get freedom. And freedom of exchange is, uh, for me, key into learning or, or into getting knowledge somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if we should just be careful not, not to be boring to the audience, right? Um, I, I mean, because you are probably not looking for masters. Hey. You know, you don't even read books, so why should you look for masters? Uh, but if so, then I think if you, and, and again, keep it part of the secret. If you identify somebody, you know, if you, through books or through literature or exhibitions, and you just realize, wow, that's damn good, you know, I want to know more. And you keep it private, personal, and make it your model, right? Just say, hmm, I want to spend time with that person or with the work of that person. And then all of a sudden you know so much more than all the others, right? And that is the great feeling. And if you can do that, have that experience with a, with a living person, right? Then you will have a feedback, you know? And it is absolutely not so that I was searching Müller Brockman. He was searching me, right? He chose me as a victim, you know, as a, as a kind of a, 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 a carrier of the modern tradition. That was the hope they had. Uh, and I agreed in a certain time, and I was curious, and I saw a privilege of... Uh, of uh, getting close to what I admired and I, I understood. And it also the role, and I think that what we brought up before, is that they were not only graphic designers. Müller Brockmann was a gallerist, right? And he was an advisor and he was a teacher. And he was, a, he was an, an officer um, in the Swiss army during war, right? At the, at the Gebirgsgrenadier. Uh, uh, I don't know who could translate that, but so grenadier uh, du montagne, eh? with with horses and carrying up uh, heavy stuff up on the top, and so you know that is experience. That's a generalist, as we say. That's a person who can do incredible different things, like you as the punk singer beside the graphic artist. 
Do you, you still have mentors nowadays? Uh, they tend to be female nowadays, while they were male in my youth. Strange enough. No, no. I, um, um, I think you you accommodate. I am a mentor. I, I have I have a master mentor relationship to my assistants, which is, which is always the one year intern we have in the studio, where. Um, I say there, there, there is, um, there is a, a, a give and take, a win-win situation, um, where I may behave as a master. Whether I personally have a master, kind of, of playful uh, relationship with Kenya Hara, maybe, mm -hmm. when I'm in Japan, and he is always. I'm, I'm his student. I'm, I behave as his pu pupil, and 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 uh, he he loves to introduce me to 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 Japanese secrets. Maybe that's a relationship, but we are also friends, and we are same age, so uh, maybe different. Yeah, but that's an important lesson for uh, what we were discussing here: the fact that. At every, at every stage of your life or career, you might get some inspiration or some relationship with new kind of journalists because that's obviously a common trait in the in the mentors you had, from what yeah. I understood in your in your yeah. Lecture. Well, I I I would would probably not uh, I would resist giving an advice there, but I speculate a bit um, whether in our community uh, in in de in design. Um, and creation, whether the a life amongst generalists is the more interesting life, could be, you know. While if I speak to engineers and uh, and bio biophysicists uh, at uh, APFL, they may feel more comfortable among specialists. But in, in our field of, of design and creation, you know, inspiration comes from the most surprising um, corners, and and the the, the more the more diverse your 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 friends uh, your your community is, the the more serendipity, as we say, and the more inspiration, the more chance is. You no, know? so. That would be my, my that, that makes me, I, I try never to repeat myself, right? I, I say, you know, every, every book gives me a chance to learn something new, right? And I think that is, uh, you know, when you get older, you are a little bit in panic, but if you say, okay, if every day and every book offers me a chance to do something I've never done before, maybe I have a chance to age well. That's probably the lesson you, you, you said you didn't want to get to give some like concrete lesson, but the, what you said about every book could be a sort of alibi to uh, yeah. discover something new is, is an interesting way to, to yeah. frame or to, to summarize what yeah. you said that, before. That, that is the no saying thing. You know, if you, if you educate yourself to, to, to consider no an equally valuable answer than yes. Right? Because it offers you, it gives you so much freedom, so much time, so much chance to invest in other things than the one you say no to. Right? It's, why, why should we consider the yes to be the only polite response to, to a proposal or to a question? Right? So, that's when I say, you know, if you offer me something which is similar to what I have, have done before, then I think if I say no and I explain to you that you will accept my answer, yeah. right? And that's, that's what I mean. And, and that was, was specialists tend to repeat themselves, right? Yeah. While generalists may say, hmm, I've been there before and let's go somewhere else and let's try this and that, so, right? Uh, yeah, yes, I, th I think we, 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 we mentioned that uh, those two kind of personality should somehow exist uh, by themselves. 
and uh, relate somehow. But uh, I, I was thinking about uh, you adding at your program uh, society recently, mm -hmm. and I, I was thinking about you resisting to the wish of adding a new chapter of knowledge in your program. And uh, I, I, because you are so curious as a personality, and you like to also to explore different fields, okay, how can you manage a, a publishing house without uh, stretching into many diversified topics, uh -huh. uh, even uh, having uh, this uh, pleasure that you preach so, so much, like mm -hmm. uh, being happy and so mm -hmm. deeply connected with uh, authors mm -hmm. and all the systems that you put in place? Um, you know, uh, I was... Uh I was advised not to add society, right, when I did, um, because already ar architecture, art, design and photography are four categories which in a bookstore are four different departments, right, while society in the bookstore is on the second floor. Huh? So if our sales representative goes and visits the book buyer, um, he may have a chance to have art, architecture, design, and photography on one floor, but for, for, for society, he has to go to the other floor. And he will miss that one. And da, da, da. Now, I, I said, well, if I could afford, I would even add another category, which would be science. Oh, no, that's on fifth floor. Right? No chance. And then I say, yes, I would still do. If I, could, if I really could afford it, science would be the next category because science is actually the driver. Uh, that's actually the spirit I mean with what, what, whatever we talk now is the spirit of science to research, to find out, you know, what can be the better solution, what can help us answer the questions which are open. And, but Mr. Fuller is one of your mentors yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and science is a super creative uh, discipline, you know, and they need designers. And designers, yeah, may be good scientists, however. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't... Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit a colorful bird, a uh, wild bird up here, but no, no, I'm, I'm, I have my feet on the ground. I, I try to survive with what I'm doing in an economy which is rather difficult, but I say freedom is a, and independency is a currency which is the most sustainable currency you can imagine. Right? If you invest in your independency, and it's a different one that comes at the age of 40, 50, it's different to the independence you may have and experience at the age of 20, 25, right? If you have to overcome that age, I don't know, maybe you, you, you can tell us about that, you know, when you get into that adult age where you may eventually have family and so, and you still feel independent, right? Then you may have a kind of a lasting freedom uh, right? But that's an investment you make when you're young. But when you... Yeah. I'm, I'm in the harvesting uh, period of my life. I feel like, yes, I'm, I'm not seeding. I'm not seeding, I'm harvesting. Right? But we talk to people who, who seed. You throw out the seed. I think it's very important that you know where you, where you plant. It's probably time to harvest some questions from the yes, room. Yes, please. Then. I think, I think <laughs> if, you, uh, if you, if you want. Uh, so are there any questions or comments in, in, in the room? We can have some time for that. Yeah. Or critique or opposition or you can... Uh, Saying no. I'm, I'm sitting very stable here and you can say this, this is all bullshit or whatever, if you argue. Hi, um, I just want to know if you, by meaning analog, you are presenting to digital, but uh, do you don't think by not talking about digital, you're missing one of the biggest change for our generation, 
like maybe was printing for book, and now we are talking about, yeah, okay, analog, it's important, of course, but not talking about digital, not be missing something very important for you? Um, yes, of course, the digital is important also for me, but I, I do not feel obliged to, to offer solution in the digital world. Um, but you, you, you are touching on an on a, on a interesting and a delicate point, right? You know, if I talk about being a journalist, I should probably know more about the digital, even so I don't need it. Right? I don't need it. It is not attractive to me. It doesn't solve my problems. It doesn't help. It doesn't it doesn't offer me the same, the same completeness as the analog does, right? So the, the analog, I, I think if you, if you followed my argument, if I say the analog is always related to something, it is it, the physicality, the materiality of the analog. You know, you can, you can question the paper, you can ask the paper, where do you come from? It has a history. This is time related, it is, it is physicality, it's weight and volume and so on. And I, I have a right to say, this is my world, right? And I just realized by now that this world is not dying. Why? Because we are all analog creatures, you know? And if you take nutrition, uh, you know, the first uh, 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 Star Trek and, and, and Sky Wars and movies, science fictions 40 years ago, you know, people were swallowing red and green pills for nutrition. That was the vision that we don't have to grow plants anymore. We can feed ourselves with nothing. Of course we can, but there is no fun, right? And there is so much offerings in the digital, which is possible and it's great, but it's no fun. And that's why I think you, you, you as designers, you are the ones who have to define what, what digital uh, uh, device or, 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 or capacities do you use for what function? You know, because not everything has to be f funny or in entertaining. And you say, okay, this is good in digital and this is good in analog. Right? And then you may allow me to, def to, to stay, to stick within the analog. And, and you become aware of the both. And you may also find out whether you, whether you tend, where do you, what do you tend towards to, right? Just understand or agree with me that it's not for or against. It's not, and because we have overcome that. That was, that was 15 years ago. It was, are you for or against the digital? Huh? And this, I think, is over. And this is, a, this is our chance. That allows us to have another conversation. Did I get the question right? Yeah, most probably. Are you OK? Thank you. We have a second question here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing your authenticity so honestly with us. Uh, I am not a designer. Um, I came here as a guest. And um, what's keeping me awake is urgency. Ur you mentioned understanding systems. And what's keeping me awake is an urgency in our society sixth uh, mass extinction, you know, climate change, you mentioned a, a number of things, or Switzerland, as opposed to glaciers disappearing by 2090. And in my role, I work with policymakers, with 
leading leaders in governments, in businesses. And I see that the power that art, design, and culture has is enormous, but it's not part of these processes. And I'm so happy you added society into your publishing focus and your thinking science. And uh, I have such a great admiration of your work and your thinking. And I would like to know also for us all, for future generations, how do you see that we can bring uh, design, uh, you know, the creative processes, the experiences, the emotions into other spaces so we can help address these urgent problems that are not being addressed mm -hmm. urgently. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think you touch on something that, um, that again has to do with time and with, the, with the, 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 the paradigm shift from the analog to the digital. Um, is that the definition of design has changed, but also not changed, right? There is, there is something in the analog world that this design was related to artistic talent, right? So the, the creation of, from scratch, the creation of something that was able to were capable to represent content, to communicate something rather complex or complicated in a formula which many people could agree. Right? That is visual communication at its best in the generation of my teachers, so to say. Now, today we have delegated everything that is, that is, uh, that was kind of uh, talent uh, or, or skill related to the software, right? So you, um, like when I, when I told my, my family that I want to become a graphic designer, they say, oh yeah, yeah, you have always been good at drawing. Do you care about drawing, communication designers today? there is always somebody there who does better, right? And if not, Photoshop and Illustrator does too. The skills of a communication designer today is totally different to what it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I would just say that what remains is that we visualize content. We we find agreeable visual representation of something that can be discussed or, 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 or uh, liked eventually by many people, and that has not changed. But the value, and I know what I talk about because we were, we were writing invoices for the artwork 40 years ago. We made good money selling craft, right? Now there is no money in craft work anymore. All the money is in concept. Right? So communication concepts, the creativity that flows into concept is the value. And then you will always find an execution or you send the data over to India and you get it back overnight and it's designed and you get beautiful drawings. Right? And that shift is something where I say, you have to deal with. I don't. I'm done. <laughs> I've created my world. Nobody will take it away from me. Right? But I defend the value which I believe will still be a value for you. And that is when you when you cherish the, the, the analog experience, and that brings you ahead of the people. Uh, you know, I don't, know, it, I don't want to go too into, into psychology. I, I would also not want to go into philosophy here, but it's a matter of fact that if you know 
what the people need, then you have the power to either give it to them or kind of, of or shape what you want to give it to them. Right? Today, so much energy is going into game design. I don't know if you follow that. Is there a department here? In Interaction game design. Interaction game design. Are you successful? You have some spin-offs, some millionaires in the room? No? Not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. Okay. It will come. It will come. In Zurich it happens and they are so proud. Ah, no? Tell me, is it entertainment or is it education or is it the repl replacement of, of a, you know, the great, glorious poster tradition in Swiss graphic design? Is Gamification of education, maybe. Uh, sorry? Gamification of Gamification. education. Yeah, yeah, okay. Do, do we need an app to learn something? Do, do we need an app to learn a language? Is that fun? Yeah? Would it be more fun to... I, I remember, I fell in love with my, my Italian teacher at the Mikro Clubschule when I was a young man. Wow. That made me go there over months. Uh, also, I didn't learn Italian, though. Uh, but, you know, you know, make up your mind. Have an opinion, you know, and, and be polite, but express your opinion. If you are against something, and defend the digital and defend the analog, have an engaged discussion, and that makes you a good school, you know? If you really allow fractions and not all students are streamlined and they are, you know? I don't, I don't know you well enough. You may invite me again and, and I spend a day in the school, right? Then we would find out. Hey. Okay, so <coughs> uh, we are ending uh, the, the Tonight uh, event, uh, I, I, I would like uh, to invite you to join uh, and uh, follow up the discussion uh, during uh, our dinner in the design room. <coughs> I would like uh, first thanks uh, Head to be able to organize this event and uh, all uh, you, of you being here and Nicola Nova uh, in order to be here to uh, discuss with Lars and especially a big round of applause to <coughs> the generous uh, 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 Lars Muller. Thank you. Okay, turn off.